Hey everyone, welcome to the support show. Today I'm going to give you a few tips on how to surface your wasteboard. I'm going to show you how to do this on the Shapeoko 5, but a lot of these techniques are very similar across all of our machines, so feel free to follow along and I hope you find something handy in this video. It's important to periodically flatten the wasteboard with the spindle. This then creates a flat plane in reference to the tip of the cutter, so our cuts are a lot more consistent in the z-axis. Over time, the MDF on your machine may swell or shrink given the right conditions. You may have some buildup of adhesive work holding, or you may have a bunch of ridges and lines from previous projects. We'll cut a thin pocket across the entirety of our wasteboard in order to flatten that to the cutter. We can then do the same kind of strategy to our stock. Uh, our colleague Kevin Barnett has a video on how to do just that. We'll link that video in the description below. When it comes to programming, the ideas here are pretty simple. We want to draw a large rectangle that covers the entirety of our MDF, and we want to assign a pocket tool path with a very shallow depth of cut. This will allow us to shave off a thin layer of our entire wasteboard so we have a nice flat surface. However, for today's example, we're going to hop over to CutRocket.com and we're going to download a pre-made flattening file by our colleague Kevin. He's already tested this file and has written down all the necessary workflow steps to make this as easy as possible. I'm going to download project. I'm then going to locate that downloaded file in my downloads folder and then open it up in Carbide Create. Once open, we'll see a long list of steps. We're going to use this as our workflow. You'll also see that there is a link to the McFly surfacing end mill at the very bottom here. Now, you could get away with doing some kind of surfacing with the quarter inch end mill, but it's going to take a long time. So we're going to use a one inch diameter surfacing bit to make quick work of flattening this wasteboard. So this looks great. Let's hop over to the machine to get it set up. Now before anything else, we'll need to remove the bit setter and any kind of fixturing or fencing that we have set up on the hybrid table. We'll start by removing the bit setter. First, make sure your machine is powered off before disconnecting any cabling. We'll then remove the two screws holding the bit setter to the T-track. We'll disconnect the bit setter extension from the bit setter and move it off to the side. Also, I'm a bit skeptical when it comes to hanging wires, so I'm going to remove the extension from the plate as well. I'll grab a pair of needle nose pliers to safely wedge in between the connector and the plate, do a gentle squeeze and gentle pull, and disconnect the extension from the plate. I'm also going to remove the clamps and jig Kevin has set up here on the machine. Sorry, Kevin. Again, this is to make sure that our cutter is free of any outstanding obstacles. I'm going to remove this fencing for the same reason. However, in retrospect, I probably could have left it there. The program shouldn't actually move that far off the hybrid table to hit those pieces. Perfect. And now that we have it, now that we have everything removed, we'll go ahead and power the machine on and get it set up in carbide motion. We'll power the machine on. We'll open up carbide motion, and then we'll click connect to cutter. But before we initialize, it's very important that we first disable our bit setter. So we'll start by clicking on settings in the top right corner. We will then click the checkbox to enable bit setter so it's disabled, and then we'll click OK in the bottom right. Don't worry, Carbide Motion holds on to that stored location so we can toggle it back on once our bit setter is reinstalled. But once that's done, let's go ahead and initialize the machine so we can load our first tool. Once the machine is done homing, I'm going to pop over to Carbide Create and just reference those notes again. It looks like Kevin wants us to install a V-bit into the spindle so we can use that fine tip to set a very accurate zero. Now we'll head back over to the machine and we'll start swapping in our V-bit. Now you'll see me grab the spindle shaft with my fingers. This will allow me to spin the collet nut and get a nice little finger tightening on the tool. Uh, this will keep it from dropping out of the collet while I grab my wrenches and you know damaging the tip of this end mill. I'll then go ahead and grab both of my collet wrenches. I'm gonna get in here and again, when I'm tightening this down, I don't wanna torque it all the way to the point where you know I'm damaging those threads. I just wanna make sure that it's nice and confidently snug. Once your V-bit is confidently installed, you'll want to pop over to the jog menu and then jog your Y-axis as far forward as it will go. You'll hold Y minus until it won't go any further. From here, click on set zero and just zero Y. Once finished, click done. We'll then want to align the tip of our V-bit with the lower left-hand corner of the first MDF slat. It's hard to see when it's this high in the air, so we'll go ahead and lower the Z and then we'll fine tune that location until we're right at the corner. 
Once I'm happy with that location, I'll go ahead and click on set zero and then zero only X. I don't want to click zero all, I'm gonna set each axis independently. So once I click zero X, I'll go ahead and click done. I'll then go ahead and raise my Z axis and center it on the gantry. This will allow me to swap in my McFly cutter. Once that is installed, we'll go ahead and set a Z axis zero and get to work. Now that my McFly is installed, I'm gonna jog over my wasteboard and grab a sheet of paper. I'll put this sheet of paper between the tool and the wasteboard. From here, I'm gonna jog my Z axis down using the fast increment. I'm gonna jog down until I'm about a half inch to an inch above the wasteboard. I'll then reduce my jog increments by pressing increment minus to one millimeter. From here, I'll keep stepping towards the paper. Once I'm starting to touch the paper with the tool, I'll reduce my jogging increments even more. From here, I'll start to move the paper back and forth while tapping the Z minus jog button. Once I feel the end mill start to pin the paper to the wasteboard, I'll make sure that the paper isn't being ripped, but it has that pressure applied. This will be the key factor in knowing our cutter is right on the surface of the material without being too high or too low. Once I'm happy with the cutter, I'll go ahead and click on set zero. And again, I'm just going to zero Z. Remember that X and Y are set to a different location and we do not want to overwrite those values. Once my Z has been set, I'll click done and I'll click on run. Let's load our file and check out the preview. As soon as we open a file in Carbide Motion, we'll be met with a G code preview. It'll simulate our file and give us a general overview of what's about to be cut. If we look at the top view, we'll see this dark blue line in the lower left hand corner representing our X and Y zero. If we click on front view, we'll go ahead and see that dark blue line on the top of our stock representing our Z zero. We can then click on the ISO view, which will give us a combination of the top and front view. Again, just another way to verify that our zeros are set correctly. We can then hop over to the G code tab to look at the setup. And then last but not least, we're testing out a new 3D G code preview inside of Carbide Motion. It's currently in its early stages. So if you test it out and you run into some bugs, please let us know at support at carbide3d.com. But here in our example, all of these previews look great. So we're gonna go ahead and click done and hop over it and start running the file. Once I click run, the cutter will raise up to the top. I can then get my sweepy and dust collection sorted out. Uh, another big tip here too, if you're using a spindle, make sure that your spindle enable button is pressed in bright red. And if you're using the 80 millimeter spindle, make sure that your chiller is turned on. Once all that looks good, click resume and let your cutter go. I'm gonna use this time to also make a huge mention of the golden rule. Don't walk away from the cutter while you're cutting. I know it can be easy if you have multiple things to do, but keep an eye on that thing and stay with your machine at all times. A couple quick tips. One, if you're on the Shapoko 5, make sure that your gantry is not in the forward shifted position. You won't be able to reach all of the MDF if that's the case. Shift your gantry back, do the surfacing operation, and then shift it forward if needed. Also, you can take a pencil and mark the corners of your MDF. This way, you'll be able to tell if your MDF has been shaven off on every side. If not, you'll want to go ahead and do multiple passes until an entire layer is shaved off in one go. Lastly, make sure to reinstall and re-enable your bit setter in Carbide Motion once you're finished. If you have any questions or run into any issues, feel free to send us an email over at support at carbide3d.com and we'll always be happy to help. Until then, have a great rest of your day.